We've been talking about consequentialist reasoning, and in particular, cost-benefit analysis. It's a standard way of approaching various kinds of decision problems, especially in business. So it's valuable to look at it. And as we've seen, there are a number of advantages of it. It gives us some kind of relatively objective answer. It enables us to go into depth thinking through various options and telling us how to think about all the possible consequences to weigh them against each other. It gives us some kind of decision rule. It doesn't just leave us with vague generalities, but actually tries to give us some solution. And it forces us to think about the effects on others. We can't just think about the effects on ourselves. We have to think about the disadvantages, the costs, to all sorts of agents, many people who are stakeholders in the outcome. And so it looks as if cost-benefit analysis has many things going for it. But there are psychological obstacles to carrying it out. It turns out to be harder than it looks. Let's see why. Think about the various steps of a cost-benefit analysis. The first thing we have to do when we're facing a decision is to identify our options. What are our choices? What options are available to us? We need to think that through carefully, because it turns out that that's critical. If we mess up the first stage of the process, then we're going to be leaving out important possibilities and we won't get a sensible result. I think often, in fact, that a lot of management skill involves identifying options accurately and being creative, thinking of options that other people would not have thought of. Well, there is a trick to this, and it becomes difficult in a lot of settings. Why? Because we get stuck in ruts. Psychologically, we tend to assimilate problems we face to problems we faced in the past. We think about models we've developed before for analyzing problems, and we use those models in understanding the next problem. It's often said that generals are always fighting the last war. They take the lessons they learned in the last war and simply apply them in a new context without realizing important things have changed. Well, the same thing can be true in cost-benefit analysis. It is easy to misidentify options, to especially leave out options because you're not creatively thinking about all the possibilities. Of course, it's also possible to think certain things are options when they really aren't if you don't have enough information. So identifying the options is harder than it looks. There's another reason why that very first step of identifying options is harder than it looks. It's easy not to recognize that there actually is a decision facing us, that there are options on the table that we're simply ignoring. We're proceeding along thinking there's not, no decision to be made, not even beginning the process of cost-benefit analysis, and failing to recognize that there are options available to us, maybe that we should take. We don't even notice that fork in the road and simply proceed on our merry way down one path when the other path would have been much better. In general, we tend to ignore sins of omission. We think about things that people do that are wrong, that make mistakes. We don't think about the things that people could have done that they didn't even think about, they didn't recognize as possibilities. The second stage of the process is to identify who might be affected by our decision. We have to think about all the possible people who might suffer a cost or enjoy a benefit as the result of our actions. And so that too is challenging. We have to think about all the possible people affected, not only directly, but indirectly. And that can be quite difficult. We've got a tendency to limit our search for stakeholders, people who are affected by the action, to too small a set. We think about, let's say, the people in the company or the people in the company together with our customers or something, and we don't think about the broader context. So it's important to think about everybody who might be affected by the action, not just our small group. The third step, of course, is to identify possible outcomes for each of those choices that we have, and then for each of the stakeholders that we've identified, we need to think about the possible costs and benefits and the probabilities of all those as we go down the list. So we've got to identify the possible outcomes and then think about how likely they are. But let's first of all just think about identifying the possible outcomes. That turns out to be very tricky too. It's much harder than it looks. There are a number of reasons for this. One thing is that we tend to ignore low probability events. So we don't think about possible outcomes that are unlikely, but on the other hand, are possible and may well happen. 
Now, it's hard to do this because, after all, there are all sorts of things that Nassim Taleb calls black swans, things that appear out of nowhere that no one was predicting. Often, later, you look back and you think, oh, yeah, we should have known. But at the time, no one had any idea this might happen. Just think about the past year and the number of surprising black swan type events that occurred when no one was really, or at least very few people, were anticipating the pandemic, for example, or the various things that happened surrounding the election. We not only tend to ignore low probability events, but once somebody draws our attention to them, then we tend to overemphasize them. We tend to start obsessing over them and assign them a much higher probability than we actually should. So our tendencies when we think about these relatively unlikely events go in two ways. We tend to not even think about them. We tend to ignore them and just treat the probability as if it were zero. But often it is not zero, and it's important to take that into account. There, there might, after all, be a sudden collapse of the housing market, or there might be a sudden technological change in the industry, or there might be a variety of other things, a general economic downturn, etc. A ship stuck in the Suez Canal and cutting off supplies, for example, of certain key items, or at least delaying it. That's something that one typically does not anticipate. Interruptions in the supply chain or sudden increases or decreases in demand. There are all sorts of things like that that can suddenly have an effect on a company. And it's hard to think of all those. It's hard to take them seriously. We ordinarily tend to ignore them. But on the other hand, if somebody says, wait a minute, what happens if the supply chain is disrupted? Then we tend to think, oh, wait a minute, that's a real possibility. And then we tend to overemphasize that and actually become too focused on it, thinking it's too high a probability. So it's hard to identify the possible outcomes that actually are possible, even if they're unlikely, and then to assign them an appropriate probability. Part of what makes it hard is that when things are unlikely, we typically don't have much experience with them. And so it's hard to know how likely they are. How likely is a major economic depression? Well, we hope pretty unlikely, but hard to say. They have happened. They don't happen frequently, but when they do, it's terrible and it changes the world. How do we assign that some kind of reasonable probability in our analyses? Another problem is that it's difficult to assign causes, especially when a lot of people are involved. Now, why does that matter? Well, because in applying a consequentialist analysis like cost-benefit analysis, we need to think about consequences. That means we need to think about the possible effects of our actions. Well, what are the possible effects? What are we going to have as a result if we do this or that or the other thing? It's hard to trace those causes and effects. It might be, for example, that there are some obvious things. We think, yes, let's build the new factory. Well, good. Okay, we know some of the effects of that. But what effect will that have on the actions of our competitors, for example? What effect will that have on our ability to attract employees? Are we building in a place that's highly desirable, so lots of people will want to join the company to go there? Will people be happy to transfer from where they are now to that new location? Or, on the other hand, is it a relatively undesirable location? Is it going to be difficult to get our people to voluntarily go there? Are we going to have trouble attracting talent to that location? And so on. All of those are things we need to think through. And then we need to think about the possible effects on that economy, what effects that's going to have on the lives of the people who are working in that plant, what effect introduction of the new production is going to have on the overall marketplace, on prices, and so on. So it's really quite tricky. It's not only a complicated problem, it's one where we have to trace causes and effects down several steps, thinking several moves ahead, and a lot depends on the actions of other people in response to what we do. It's difficult to anticipate that. This is a general strategic problem where the outcome of our action depends on the simultaneous actions of other people. So it can be very hard to do this. I've noticed in the commercial real estate market, for example, many people tend to get the same idea around the same time. So it looks like Austin is growing rapidly, for example. Hey, wouldn't it be great to build an office building in Austin? And so people begin to do that. But then it turns out all of these are in planning stages at roughly the same time. 
they don't know about one another's activities, and so all of a sudden you get a bunch of buildings being built at once, you get a lot of different buildings entering the commercial real estate market all at the same time. Well, that may be something none of them anticipated. And so that kind of problem, that kind of problem of tracing causes and effects when the effects depend on the actions of others is especially difficult. There's another problem. We tend to focus on people rather than on systems. Why does that matter? Because often what we do changes the way the system works, partly because it gives people different incentives within the structure. Giving workers different kinds of incentives, even within a company, can produce very different outcomes. People are going to start adapting to the incentives. I've noticed this often happens when people introduce a new system of employee evaluation. People are going to adapt their behavior to what you put on those metrics. They're going to say, oh, that's what matters? Let's say there are these five things and you want me to focus on those five things? Okay. They're going to devote increased attention to those five things. They're going to neglect other things because, after all, they don't enter into the evaluation. Their raises, their promotions, and so on won't depend on them. But they may turn out to be really crucial to the company. So it's easy to mess that up and end up redirecting people in a way that is really not very desirable. Why? Partly we're thinking about people, but partly we are failing to think about the overall system and the effects of implementing that system. Systems will change incentives. People will start behaving differently when you change the nature of the system. And it's often true in government as well as in business that people neglect those effects. We're not very good at thinking about systems and the way in which changing a system changes the behavior of people. The last thing is that we tend to be pretty bad about reasoning about risks. We have trouble identifying low probability events, as I've mentioned, but it's not just that. We tend to establish a baseline. There's an entire theory about this, known as prospect theory. I don't want to go into the details of that here, but what it amounts to is we tend to think, well, in rather strange terms sometimes about risks and benefits. We don't treat a dollar lost as equivalent to a dollar gained. We take losses more seriously. But of course, what counts as a gain and what counts as a loss depends on where we set that baseline. We're not very good about reasoning about probabilities in general, and then add risk, add the potential for loss, we become even worse. So it's hard not only to get the probabilities right and to identify possible outcomes correctly, but then to think through how seriously to take various risks and compare them appropriately to benefits. It is something we are psychologically, well, equipped to do in a certain way, and at times that can get us into real trouble. At this point, we move on to the next stage of cost-benefit analysis, which is determining the costs and benefits for each of those stakeholders. We've identified the stakeholders, we've identified the possible outcomes, and now we have to look at those possible outcomes and say, well, how good is this? How bad is this for this person or this class of people? That can be quite hard to do. For one thing, their assessment of what is a cost and what is a benefit, and how much of a cost and how much of a benefit, may be quite different from our own. But not only do we have trouble putting ourselves in other people's shoes and understanding how much of a cost this will be to them, how much of a benefit it will be to them, but we also face other kinds of difficulties. First of all, we tend to discount the future, and that's entirely reasonable. We'd rather have a pain in the distant future that are paying today, and we'd rather have a dollar in our pockets today than a dollar in our pockets in the distant future. So benefits and costs, we take more seriously the closer they are to us. But now how much does the value of a pleasure or a pain, to put it in Bentham's terms, or cost or a benefit more generally, how quickly does that get discounted in the future? How quickly does the importance of it diminish? It's hard to say. And different people may react very differently to that. So the choice of the discount rate turns out to be crucial. And if different people have different discount rates, if you are pretty much a, hey, I live for today type of person, and somebody else is instead a sort of person who is constantly pla planning for the future and delaying gratification and so on, it can be hard to compare pleasures and pains or costs and benefits for the two of you simply because you're using very different discount rates. 
One of you is discounting the future pretty heavily and focusing on the present. Another is treating the future as very, very important and so applying a discount rate that is actually very mild. And how do we, A, how do we know what various stakeholders have as a discount rate? Secondly, how do we identify what is a reasonable choice even for ourselves, let alone for anyone else? There are other problems. We tend to ignore the possibility that people will find out what we're doing. Now, what does it matter? You might say, hey, I got nothing to hide. Well, in business, you often have something to hide, and not just because you might be doing something immoral or corrupt, or at least it's going to really anger some people if they find out. You may well be doing something that if your competitor finds out, is going to cause you real trouble. For example, to use that commercial real estate example, suppose various other competing companies find out, ooh, you're making an investment in building office buildings in this area. They may think, that, that must be a good idea, and jump in too. Often, it's important to keep trade secrets, not only the ingredients of your special sauce, but also decisions like that. It's important to know when to allow certain information to become public. And people tend to assume they'll be able to keep secret what they want to keep secret. But often it's quite difficult. And so what happens if the information gets out? And how likely is it that other people are going to find out before you really want them to? It's hard to know the answer to those questions, and it's hard to think about those possibilities. The next step is to calculate the expected gains and losses for each stakeholder. Well, if we've identified the possible outcomes, if we have identified the effects on each stakeholder, and then assessed costs and benefits, and thought about the probabilities of those, it should be relatively simple to do the calculation of the expected costs and expected benefits for each of those stakeholders. I say it should be simple, but often it's quite a bit more difficult than it would seem at first, and not only because sometimes the math gets rather difficult, or we have to make all sorts of assumptions about possible effects, about how important that will be to a certain person, about discount rates, and all sorts of other things. There are other things that make this complicated. First of all, we tend to underestimate the importance of chance. We tend to think we actually know what the effects are, and we tend to think we can assign probabilities and assume that the most probable things will happen. We tend to forget about the fact that often those causal relationships can be disrupted by all sorts of other factors. You might think that if you do this, that follows, and you might think it's pretty simple, but not necessarily. It might turn out, for example, that all sorts of unanticipated consequences follow. And why? Because a lot of chance events came in and made those causal relationships you were assuming much more complicated. After all, it can turn out that what is normally a good method for doing something can be disrupted, can be defeated by all sorts of extraneous factors. And so it's hard to anticipate those. We've talked about those problems before if they're relatively unlikely but we tend to assume that we've got greater certainty about our own calculations than we really do. It's hard to be humble, and it's hard to be humble in this kind of context, especially when we've done lots of analysis. And we think we've got extensive reports and all these spreadsheets that are analyzing the possible options. Easy to forget the lot. Nevertheless, despite all our planning, despite all our analysis, depends on chance. And for that very reason, we tend to deny uncertainty. We tend to think we've got the analysis that shows what's the best option. But in fact, it's often really unclear. There's a high degree of uncertainty. And when you put that in a business context, it's often really hard to know how much to trust your own calculations. How much do you trust that you've identified all the relevant options, that you've identified all of the relevant stakeholders, that you've been able to assess how those possible outcomes are going to affect each one of those stakeholders? How confident are you that you've assessed the probabilities correctly and therefore done the calculation of expected results correctly? Very hard to do. And so we do the best we can, but uncertainty is introduced at every single step of the process. And it's hard to recognize how uncertain the outcomes are and to adopt the proper stance of humility about what we end up recommending at the end. Now, there are other kinds of problems as well. We're not very good at assessing ourselves, at assessing our own strengths and weaknesses, at assessing 
our, well, <laughs> our skill at doing each of the steps of this process. And because self-evaluation is often not something we're very great at, it's hard to know how much confidence to have in the results of our own use of cost-benefit analysis. People suffer under a lot of cognitive illusions. They, for one thing, tend to be too optimistic. They forget about some of the things that can disrupt their plans. They tend to view themselves or their coworkers a bit too favorably and don't recognize that they have weaknesses that are going to affect the potential outcomes. They tend to assume they'll be in control of events when actually it might be that chance factors or other people are going to end up being in control of what the effects of the action will really be. They tend to over-assess their own skill and their own knowledge. Psychologists call this the Dunning-Kruger effect. It can turn out that in a lot of contexts, the people who are best at something are actually the most humble, and the people who are worst at it actually have the most confidence. Now, there's been recent controversy about how far this result extends and how solid it is. But in some contexts, at least, it seems as if there's good evidence for it. In some contexts, people have a pretty good idea of how good they are at a task. But in other contexts, they're really pretty bad at it. They tend to assume they're really good when, in fact, they're just meh. Um, in other cases, they really think, oh, I'm not very good, even though they're very good. And why? Because they know enough to realize how much more there is out there that they don't know. In fact, there's a word for this. Second year of college is often called the sophomore year. Sophomore is based on a Greek root that means a wise fool. The idea is, well, you've been in college for a year, you've learned some stuff, you are wiser than you were. On the other hand, you're still a fool because you don't yet realize how complicated things get and how much lies out there that you do not yet know. It's easy early in your career as well later to overassess your own talent, overassess your own knowledge. Well, let me close by just saying one of the greatest dangers is what Taleb calls the black swan. Donald Rumsfeld talked about the unknown unknowns as the greatest danger. Some things we know, and we know that we know them. Some things we don't know, but we at least know that we don't know them and realize, hmm, there's something that all this depends on that we've got to make some assumptions about, but we don't really acknowledge. There are some things we know we probably don't even know that we know. We have some abilities we don't recognize, for example. But then the important category, and the really disruptive category, is the unknown unknowns. The things that are relevant that we don't know, and we don't even realize that we don't know them, usually because they're not even on our radar screen. They are not things we're even thinking of as relevant as real possibilities. It's those unknown unknowns that are the greatest danger. And that's closely related to the idea of a black swan. In the satires, Juvenal talks about a rare bird in the lands and very much like a black swan. A black swan, a low probability event, unpredictable, often seems predictable in retrospect, but it's not really. It's an outlier. It's the kind of thing that doesn't go on normally that we aren't anticipating, and suddenly there it is. That kind of thing can happen, and much of human history is shaped by those unknown unknowns, those rare events, the black swans, that enter when you least expect them and disrupt the results of your calculation. So for all of those reasons, some psychological and some just about the complexity of the world. It's hard to do a cost-benefit analysis. It's way harder than it looks.